know you're at a tech conference when there's three computers, five personal devices, and two people. <laughs> so I'm truly, truly thrilled to be here. Um, I've been, as David mentioned, fortunate enough to be a member of the DML community for the last five years or so, and it's been an incredible experience and ride. Um, I remember when we were just a small group with big goals. We could have fit in one meeting room in a Holiday Inn in Mattoon, Illinois. Anyone here from Mattoon? Now look at us. We number close to 1,000. We hail from North America, including Canada and Mexico, and of course Mattoon. Uh, South America, Brazil, Europe, including England, Italy, the Netherlands, Asia, Bangladesh, India. We represent institutions of higher education, K through 12 schools, museums and libraries, community youth organizations, private companies and entrepreneurial startups, governmental agencies and offices, including the US Army, and even the Federal Reserve, as well as Lady Gaga. Now you tell me, another community that has that diversity. So, we are now officially a big movement with audacious goals here at the Wyndham in San Francisco. So, to MacArthur Foundation, to the DML Hub, to all of you, congratulations, you have arrived, and the time is now. So, why are we all here? What are these audacious goals, and what is this historical moment all about? Well, it was in Silicon Valley, just about half a, half, a century, half a century ago, that microcomputers, among many other key technologies, were first developed. It was with the emergence of these microcomputers and other technologies that for the first time in US history, people began to contemplate seriously the potential of computer technologies for education. In the last 40 years, the exponentially increasing powers and dramatically decreasing costs of computer technologies have surpassed even our wildest dreams of those early days. Yet, there is still very little evidence of any major successful tech-enabled innovation or disruption altering the structure and school of mainstream education, in my humble opinion. That change has been constrained less by the lack of technological innovation than it has been by the limits of our sociological imagination. So what do I mean by that? In the last decades of the 20th century, the kinds of education, tech, education technology products and promises, let's say school information management systems, courseware programs, managed learning environments, all of these that came out of the Silicon Valley as well as other centers of innovation, tended to focus primarily on increasing the efficiency of schooling as we know it, rather than reimagining and improving the efficacy of learning as it could be. Now, the first instinct when new technologies are introduced into any field is to automate and accelerate existing activities. So the same has just simply been true in education. Thus, in the past, enticing looking technologies have led many innovators and entrepreneurs to build tools for schools, backrooms, and classrooms without thinking about how they could or should change teaching and learning just simply trying to make them faster and easier. More recently, in the first decade of the 21st century, a wave of newer digital learning products have emerged on the scene, promising new game-based, mobile-enabled, geolocative, platform-driven teaching and learning experiences. Compared to many of their predecessors from decades ago, this new cohort of entrepreneurs and innovators have focused largely on products seeking to serve the learner and outside of the school. As someone who has helped to create the conditions that drive this kind of outside-in grassroots innovation, I have to say that I believe that for education innovation to ultimately benefit the majority of kids in this world, which is why I hope we are all here, it must eventually travel to the center of kids' lives. And today, for the good or the bad, wherever you stand, schools continue to occupy the center of many child's, children's lives, certainly here in the US. Given that, as long as we constrain ourselves to thinking about this notion of schooling, this gets to my sociological imagination point, as something that can only happen between 28 students and one teacher within 1,500 square feet and from the hours of 8 a.m. to 3 p.m., then I don't care what an entrepreneur and innovator from Silicon Valley, Silicon Alley, or Silicon Roundabout develops. We will never fundamentally change the future of teaching and learning. 
and those entrepreneurs will have a hard time getting the opportunity and most will die trying. Thus, in a world where the lower cost and greater ubiquity of digital media and de personal devices, the opportunity to create new models of anywhere, anytime learning, including but not limited to schools, is greater than ever, as is the responsibility. When 30% of our high school students here in the US drop out, and as high as 50% in the city in which I live, and 93% of them are online, and 78% of them have cell phones, and a steadily increasing 40% have smartphones, we need to reach these kids where they are, when they need it, and with whatever tools, this, this moment is more important than ever. So, while there are fundamental differences between the older school-centered education technology and new, newer learner-centered digital perspect learning perspectives, these communities need not be in conflict as they have been in the past. <clears throat> in fact, I believe they are complements to one another. They are critical and necessary synergies of one another. And I believe that the time for that ground shift is right now, right here, with the convergence of different communities and perspectives coming together in this room. Building a new future for teaching and learning in a connected world not only allows but requires bridging in-school and out-of-school learning practices and philosophies through networks of institutions and opportunities. In a world where DC-7s have given way to Dreamliners, telegrams to smartphones, don't we owe it to our kids that schooling should give way to learning? So, I am now going to pass the mantle to John Silly Brown. But before, please let me introduce him. John Silly Brown, AKA JSB, is a visiting scholar and advisor to the provost at the University of Southern California and the independent co-chairman of Deloitte Center for the Edge. Prior to that, he was the chief scientist of Xerox, Xerox Corporation and the director of its Palo Alto Research Center, otherwise known as PARC, right here in Silicon Valley. He held this position for near, nearly two decades, and while head of PARC, he expanded the role of corporate research to include topics such as radical innovation, organizational learning, complex adaptive systems, and nanotechnologies. I'd say most of those are relevant to the future of teaching and learning, and maybe nanotechnologies will be part of your talk, too. <laughs> it's too late. That wave is over. His personal research interests include digital youth culture, digital media, and institutional innovation. I have had the pleasure of knowing JSB for the last 15 years. We met when I was about 12 years old. <laughs> Since that time, he has been an incredible friend, an amazing colleague, and an incredibly necessary mentor. Today, he's going to talk to us about a world where we imagine the constraints of classrooms and chalkboards giving way to the expansiveness of networks and web searches, a world where entrepreneurial learners find not only the resources, but the peers and experiences to learn, make, play, anywhere, anytime. And with that, on to you. <laughs> 